Instead of focusing on winning arguments, we're teaching the basic fundamentals of sales and marketing and how we can use them to win in the world of politics, teaching you how to meet people where they're at on the issues they care about. Welcome to The Brian Nichols Show. Well, hey there, folks. Brian Nichols here on The Brian Nichols Show. And thank you for joining us on, of course, another fun-filled episode. I am, as always, your humble host. And today, we are going to be doing some smarter sales. And that's going to start off with some smart calling today. I'm joined by the man who has really made him himself the, the king of smart calling. One art subject. Welcome to The Brian Nichols Show. Brian, thank you so much for having me on. It's a pleasure. Absolutely, Art. Thank you so much for joining the program. And thank you, as I mentioned before, when we started our conversation here today off air, thank you for all you're doing in, in terms of helping show us how to make smarter calls when we're going out, not only reaching out to new prospects, but uh, dare I say, as we're bridging the world of sales and politics, when we're going out and talking to your average person. And uh, you, you wrote uh, an amazing part of, it was a Brandon Bornanson's book, Sales Secret. And I, I just read it you know, many times over, highlighter in hand. And uh, before we go into the specifics of some just gems that you outlined there, uh, you've been doing this for a while. You have uh, amazing books that people can go ahead and check out. And, and number one, the book here uh, that is over on Amazon, I'll make sure I include the link, um, is going to be the, you know, my computer will actually share the screen. No, no I guess it's not going to share the screen today. There we go. The Smart Calling, Eliminate the Fear, Failure, and Rejection from Cold Calling. We'll make sure we include that in the show notes, folks. So if you are interested, your interest has been peaked today, uh, you'll be able to have a resource. But with that being said, Art, let's start off with you. Introduce yourself to the Brian Nichols Show audience. And how did you find yourself in the world of making smart calls? Well, I have been in uh, sales all my life, as most people have, actually, because life is sales and uh, everybody's a born salesperson, but some just choose not to make it as a career. But <laughs> as it turns out, most of my jobs all throughout high school and college were sales. And then when I went out into the uh, real world, I took a job with the old AT&T long lines way back in the day. And uh, that was what was called the Bell System Telemarketing Center when telemarketing wasn't a bad word. <laughs> so we were doing business to business inside sales at the time. And I realized I was a great salesperson, but a not, not a very good employee, meaning that I was, again, good at sales, but I tended to not accept the politics, if you will, that were going on with, within the organization. So I decided to leave at the ripe old age of uh, 23 and start my own company with a partner and uh, just grew it from there. So here I am 30 plus years later, actually more than that, 35 plus years later, an overnight success in, uh, in business to business sales and training and uh, writing and producing material. Smart Calling is actually my flagship book, my most recent book. And essentially what it is, is a lot of common sense. Now get this, because this is probably gonna blow some people's minds out there. Smart Calling is knowing something about the people that we're calling so that we can make our message tailored, personalized and customized so it's relevant to them so they'll have some interest in it. Boy, that's a novel concept, isn't it? <laughs> it's it's so common sense, right? It's so basic. And, and I mean, I love that you, you said that. It is common sense. And this is where I think, I mean, you know, not taking an intentional hard turn towards the world of politics, but I mean, this is where we we so miss the conversations with each other because it ends up being, I have my pet project, my pet issue that I'm super concerned about. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just tell you why you need to be concerned and not only see my issue as the most important issue, but you need to buy my solution, right? Because it's not only the issue that's the most important thing to me, but I think, or at least I hope my solution is going to be the best solution versus, and this is where you're bringing this, this intelligence, right? As we bring in the approach of smart calling, if you actually speak to a person on what you would assume to be issues they actually care about based on who they are, um, you know, being the, the target market you're aiming for and knowing who your ideal customer persona is, 
then you should be able to make an educated pitch or an educated call to that individual. And hopefully you will be able to enter into a conversation that's in their world, something that they're likely already discussing with people in their, their, you know, whether it's their family, their friends, um, if it's more political or if it's in the business world, something they're discussing with people at the sea level, something they're discussing with their coworkers. So I think right there, we can assign the value and the importance of looking at intelligence, being smart when we're going out and entering in these conversations, Art. I want to get a transcript of what you just said there, because that's going to be some great ad copy for the book. That was amazing. <laughs> Good job. And and really taking it back into just normal everyday life. I mean, I agree. You can apply this to politics. You apply it to anything uh, in any aspect of life, because bottom line, smart calling is all about trying to understand what's going on in the other person's world first, having that mindset, and then not making my message all about me and what I want, but instead what they want. I mean, the the old great quote from the late great Zig Ziglar is, we can get whatever we want in life if we just help enough other people get what they want. And when we go into any conversation whether it be a sales conversation, a political conversation, or a conversation with our kids, if we just step back and say, what's going on in their world and what might they want right now and how can I help them, we're going to be much better off than trying to pitch what we want. Yeah, well, I had this conversation with Tim Wackel back uh, a couple of months ago, and it was the importance of understanding about timing. And I told this story where I had a guy on my on, on the phone that I was talking to, and I could tell just from the onset that the conversation was not going to go well. He was he was just very gruff, very short with me. And in my having the conversation with him, I actually took a time out. Now, granted, this is also happening here. We're kind of in this weird economic, I don't know, like kind of on hold period, it feels like still. Um, there are still companies who obviously are making decisions and moving forward with things, but there are other companies who are trying to just hold on to a single thread that's left. And they're doing a lot of consolidations, a lot of downsizing. And this, this guy I was talking to, he found out that his company was being acquired. And what was going to happen was either A, their IT department was going to be merged into the new IT department and they were going to be you know, a part of this new department or B, his entire team, including him, uh, would be entirely axed and the new IT department would take over all IT operations for their, their company as well as the acquisition. So in that conversation, I was able to realize based on the fact that, yeah, I knew there's a lot of turmoil happening out there and something's off. I just paused the conversation. I, I didn't want to push because if I, if I kept on pushing, I know that he's not going to respond at all in a positive way because he's not in the position to have that conversation. And, and I mean, I think right there, we saw this in COVID and I would love to hear your perspective on this art because when COVID started, the idea of understanding where your customer was, was so important. I'm in the greater telecommunications and cybersecurity world. And I mean, goodness, being able to stay in contact with not only you know, your, your loved ones, but if you're a business owner, to be able to stay in contact with your customers, that was top of mind. And oh, all of a sudden you have all these employees working remotely and all these endpoint vulnerabilities that just pop up across the board. So all of a sudden cybersecurity became top of mind issue. And, and now we're seeing that's still ramping up and up and up. But it speaks to the conversations that people were having in those boardrooms or virtually, um, you know, when, when we were all told to stay home. So, I mean, it really does speak to you have to know what is the issue your customers experience. But, but take it a step further, the specific person that you're speaking to, what is it? What's in their world? What has what, what I mean, has it been the worst day of their life? Have they just learned something awful? Has it been the best day of their life? And, and to be able to, to not only have the context of doing the research. And I love that you mentioned that too, um, you know, specifically in, in your, your writings is you have to go out and do research. Can you dig into more of where people can learn about who it is that they're speaking to? Because I think sometimes we think we have an idea of who the person is we're speaking to, but we end up characterizing that person as a caricature and not really speaking to who they actually are, but who we think we want them to be. Yeah. Can I come back to that? question yes. because I, I definitely want to answer it. Sure. But you, you said something earlier when you gave your example, and I just want to highlight it since it's so important what 
what what you were experienced there with with that person who was really in a state of flux of the unknown and by caring about him as a person and probably i would imagine you asked some questions about him and his situation and what his outlook is and and you probably built a little bit of a relationship and then you you left it where it was so now, if you think about this going forward, what are the possible outcomes and the possible results? So let's say he does stay there and he gets absorbed into the department and maybe he's going to be a leader in that department. Now you still have an opportunity with him moving forward. He's going to remember you as somebody who had empathy and then just didn't try to push your solution down his throat. If by chance he gets downsized, you're probably going to still stay in contact with him. He's going to wind up somewhere, probably in a decision-making capability, and you still have another contact that you may be able to help, and he's going to still probably remember you because, again, you didn't try to pitch him what you wanted to sell. And you're right. That is or what was going on during the, uh, at least the early days of COVID. I did a bunch of training on it, on how, how to message during those times, which really, Brian, isn't any different than what we should be doing all the time, which is asking questions. Uh, uh, well, I'm going to answer your question here. Where, <laughs> where do we do the research in order to get that conversation in the first place? But once we do get that conversation, like uh, my friend Tim Weckl said on a previous podcast, asking questions, finding out, again, what's going on in their world. They want to talk about the most important person in, in their world other than their family, which is themselves, right? So going back to your question, where do we get information? Well, there's more information available to us than at any point in, in history with a couple keystrokes, right? So whatever your favorite online resource is for getting information in your specific industry, and every industry has them, whether there be certain, certain directories or associations or whatever, certainly LinkedIn, certainly Google is one. If I could give a plug here for a, a buddy of mine, I don't know if you're familiar with Sam Richter. He is the number one sales intelligence guru in, in the world. The guy just, I mean, it blows my mind how smart he is on how to use the internet. But actually, he put together a tool which saves salespeople a tremendous amount of time. And if I could just give the URL for that, it's called smartcallingintel.com, smartcallingintel.com. It is a premium service, but it can save hundreds of hours per year for people just doing searches and, and collecting information. Now, in addition to all these online sources, the best source of intelligence is or are people. And I use a term and I talk about it in the book and I go through the entire process, which really should not be uh, unfamiliar to people in the IT world. And it's social engineering. Social engineering is simply talking to people other than your decision maker for the purpose of collecting intelligence so that you can have a more relevant message when you ultimately do speak with the decision maker. Now, of course, social engineering was popularized by uh, Kevin Mitnick, notoriously the most uh, famous computer hacker probably of all time. And he talks about it in his book, The Art of Deception, where how, how he would hack into companies, um, computer systems and phone systems by using the weakest link in any company security system, which you know is what? The, the people, right? Yep, yep. Point and zero. <laughs> it's so you. So we so we use social engineering for reputable purposes, and it's nothing more than calling in and talking to anybody. It could be, uh, for example, in the IT department. Maybe we could talk to somebody other than the decision maker. We could talk to an operator, an analyst, whomever. Um, or depending on what you're selling, again, it could be anybody up and down the decision making chain or not even a decision maker. But we always introduce ourselves and our company and we share that I'm going to be speaking with so and so, your director of IT, your, your CIO, whomever. And I want to make sure I'm prepared when I do. So I'd like to ask you a couple questions. So in my case, I call into the sales department. I'll get a salesperson on the phone because we know they all like to talk, right? <laughs> and I'll say, hey, Art Subcheck here with Business by Phone. I'm going to be speaking with your VP of sales. And, and I'll add this too. And I'll say, uh, I, I'm, I'm not a prospect for you, but what I have ultimately might be able to help you. I want to make sure I'm prepared when I speak with them. I like to ask you a couple questions. And then we just simply go into the questions. 
So this gives you real time, great information because they're going to tell you, I mean, people are conditioned to answer questions. Yeah. Well, and I, I don't know about any other sales guy who's out there listening to the show right now, but one of my best friends in, in all of sales, whenever I'm doing prospecting is always the gatekeeper. I know that it's weird. Like how everybody has this weird, like a, uh, just aversion towards the gatekeeper. I always found that the gatekeeper could be my best friend in helping me figure out who the person is that I'm reaching out to. Like uh, there was one account. I remember it distinctly. Um, it ended up being one of the, the biggest accounts I got when I first started out and I was just so excited about it. And uh, it was me and another sales guy at the company I work at. Um, and we were both going towards this account. And uh, we knew that the the IT guy was relatively new, um, the new global director of IT. So we were both trying to get in touch with him and trying to get into his purview. And, um, you know, he, the, the the one coworker, he, he was just, you know, constantly calling his DID, calling, just going through the, the phone system, doing the dial by name, just anyway, trying to get this guy to see him. And uh, I called in and I got the receptionist through the main line versus doing the DID. And for anybody who's one of DID is your direct inward dial. So it's like the, the actual number going right to that person. Um, so I called the, the receptionist and I, I said, hey, you know, I've been trying to get in touch with, I'm just going to, you know, for his sake, I was trying to get in touch with uh, with uh, Bob. And, uh, you know, it, I was trying to get in touch with him. I noticed that his, uh, his voicemail was filled up. I didn't want to go ahead and just bombard him with emails. So what would be the best way to get in touch with him? And she told me that the Bob, um, you know, he's usually very busy during the summertime because his daughter was doing summer camps for soccer. So he, she was going all over the place. So he, he's not really in the office that much. Um, so I, I just like, I'm not, I'm not really sure. But if you were to send something in the mail, maybe that would be the best way to get in touch with him. So you know what I did? I went right over. I wrote a nice little handwritten letter in my chicken scratch and I sent it over to him. And I ended up booking that appointment within a week. Because I was able to learn from the receptionist what was the best way to get in touch with with Bob, and it, it made my coworker upset. Um, which it, I mean, I, it kind of made me laugh a little bit because I just started probably like a week or two earlier, and uh, he'd been there for about like you know seven or eight months, and he felt like he was you know pretty well seasoned and stuff, and he knew what he was doing. He's like, ah, Brian's not gonna get this one, um, and I and I got it within a week. And when I ended up moving forward with the sale, we actually ended up closing the business. Um, you're darn right. I use the fact that I, I learned that his daughter uh, you know, played soccer as a means to build rapport. Um, you're darn right. I use the fact that my CEO's daughter also plays a lot of soccer. And I use that in conversation. And you're darn right that I got some, uh, some professional soccer tickets to send him and his daughter to go enjoy because those were things that they actually cared about. Awesome. And this, I would love to turn towards this part of the conversation because right now, one of the hardest things I think, and this was my coworker, um, this was me up until I, I sent that letter, is cutting through the clutter. There's so much clutter out there. It's information overload. I think the old you know way of selling, which was to instead of being the trusted advisor, it was more so how could you information them to death? Um, you know, how many white papers can you fill up their inbox with? And um, I think we're getting more to a point where going towards that trusted advisor is is proving more. Uh, you know, more helpful for not only the salesperson, but also the prospect. But how do we actually get to the point Art, of you know, not only getting the opportunity to be the trusted advisor, but to actually break through the clutter and get into that purview of that person at the onset? Well, and again, let me go back to something that you just mentioned here. And, and I love your philosophy on and I call them assistance. And I have an entire chapter in the book and it's titled Assistance, Not Gatekeepers. And if you think about just the term gatekeeper, it's negative and it's adversarial. And there was something on LinkedIn the other day, and I'm, I'm just getting so annoyed with LinkedIn with the, with the pseudo experts on there saying things like, here's how you get past the gatekeeper. Here's how you go through the gatekeeper. Well, I've been teaching my entire career that we, we need to work with assistance because you're a prime example. And I've got hundreds of thousands of other examples from my followers who are working with them as opposed to against them. So really to, to answer your question, you kind of answered your question. One is let's work with the people around the decision maker in order to get access to that person. It's interesting. I was on another podcast yesterday. It was actually a live stream. And we talked about this very topic. 
And then I did get a LinkedIn request from a salesperson afterward who said, oh, I'm so glad you said that. He said, I've been working with assistants my entire career. Matter of fact, he said, I'm working on a multi-million dollar deal right now where the assistant actually walked me into the decision maker's office and walked him in virtually. But still, that was not trying to go past or through or, or over. Um, other ways to get to the decision maker? Well, again, my smart calling process involves doing your research, doing your social engineering, and then putting it into your messaging so that you have something that's relevant, that's on point, that's timely, that's something that's going on in their world so that it sets you apart from the thousands of messages that everybody gets every day and responds to almost none of them. And we can, we, can, we can message in a variety of different ways. Of course, I'm the phone guy, but I'm also a believer in, in using email for touches, not to necessarily sell, okay? Because we're all bombarded with emails and there are salespeople out there who just rely on sending out their emails and then their follow-up email with the inane, hey, just bumping this to the top of your <laughs> inbox. Oh my God, give me a break. Don't you love it? Come on, Art. Oh, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a believer in using video messaging as well because that kind of bridges the visual gap. And I'm not talking about just doing Zoom meetings. I'm talking about sending a message in a video that's personalized, customized, and has something of value. And of course, text where it's appropriate if you have permission to, to use somebody's cell phone. And of course, the, the, the thing that's guaranteed to get open and read, what you just gave an example of, a handwritten note. I mean, think about that. That's almost a 100% success rate of getting opened and read. And when you can make your message relevant, those are all going to enhance your chances of standing out from the noise and the clutter and making an impact so that we have a chance, at least at a conversation. But then that's just the beginning of the battle. Then the rest of it is not saying in your opening, oh, I want to set up 15 minutes uh, to... Uh, get you on a, on a meeting or get you on a webinar or whatever. Uh, to me, that that's so ridiculous because if I already have somebody on the phone live, why would I want to set up a non, another conversation when I'm already on a conversation? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's so, <laughs> I teach this to my team all the time too. Like when you get the person on the phone, continue the conversation, like just, just, constantly try to figure out and this and this is where you you also started to turn the conversation as well is figure out what it is that's going to get them talking um and i mean i don't know about you art but when i get uh, you know one of those telemarketers that call me and tell me about my, my auto warranty i'll laugh because i'll say like i just got a brand new car i know my auto warranty hasn't expired yet so you, you're you're just being more of the clutter i'm not paying attention to you and that speaks to why it is so important to, to be different. And I would also, as we go towards the end of the show, this is why it's important to have social proof, to have people in your corner who not only are going to say, not, yeah, hey, you know, this art guy, yeah, he's not just, you know, he's not just, you know, saying stuff you, know, you can do. He can actually do it. He's done it for me. And here's how he's done it. Um, I, I call it the, the who, how, and how uh, approach when I talk to my team. Who you are, how you do things, and how you've helped other people. Um, and, and if you can go ahead and explain that, to a person when you get them on the phone, but also continue that conversation, ask them questions. And maybe this is something that we get stuck with because I, I know I, I was in theater. You know, I think uh, sales is just as much as art and science as it is a performance. Um, but you also need to, while not reading the script and just, you know, becoming the person who just sounds like a robot, you have to internalize your script. And then, you know, a la Steve Carell and Rain Wilson in the office, go ahead and improv when you can. But at the end of the day, make sure that, that that improv scene still ends in a way that the story can move forward. You have to be able to have the, the comfortableness in not only who you are and your abilities, but also what you're going to say and, and really your product you're selling. If you don't believe in your product, I don't know what you're doing. You're wasting your time, honestly. Um, but I just looked at the clock. We're already hard pressed the time or the, the time ticks by so fast. So let's go into this really quick. Social proof. Um, give us your overview of that. And then as we go towards the tail end of the conversation, I want people to be able to, to go ahead and continue the conversation. Obviously, that seems to be a reoccurring theme today of our conversation is continuing conversations. So obviously, we want to make sure we point them towards uh, all your, your links and social media. So we'll end with that. But let's dig into social proof art. And how about this? Um, we'll let you give the chance here for final thoughts. Anything that you really feel is is top of mind, 
pressing from our conversation today do you want the audience to leave with? Well, I would say whether you're in professional sales, meaning it's part of your title and part of your career, or whether you're just interacting with people in general every day, which is almost every one of us, I would encourage you before you start the conversation, just to take a second and try to put yourself in the other person's shoes. And I heard this saying a long time ago, can't remember who it was, but he said, in order to put yourself in, a, in somebody else's shoes, you have to take your own shoes off first. So to understand somebody else's perspective, we have to take off our filters and really try to understand where are they coming from. And again, so whether we're in a sales conversation, a political conversation or sports conversation, whatever, if we can at least try to understand that other person, it's going to be a much better conversation for everybody. There's going to be a better outcome. And it probably is going to help you get what you want, or at least some maybe open up somebody's ideas so that they might consider your point of view as well. And uh, again, nothing earth shattering here. It's common sense, but common sense is common sense for a reason. <laughs> common sense is in fact common sense for a reason. Well, folks, if, if you got value out of learning how to effectively use your, your time, your energy, and your resources, and not just making calls, but making smart calls, well, I would love to hear about it. And I'm sure Art would as well. So Art, if people want to continue the conversation, where can they go ahead and uh, find you, support you, but also... Uh, we got this new book uh, that well, not a new book. It's the new version um, of, of the book. It's the I think the third edition uh, where it is a smart calling eliminate the fear of failure and rejection. Yeah, it is. It is your third edition 2020 here. So where can folks go ahead and find that? Uh, I think it's Amazon, right? Yeah, yeah. You buy through Amazon. I don't even sell that book. I, I have a number that we sell, but that book I don't even sell. It goes through a publisher, but I do have a free companion course that goes along with it. So if you go to this site, smart-calling.com, smart-calling.com, and you can click through to Amazon, buy the book, and then there's a spot there for you to sign up for the free companion course that has tons of audio, video, text, messaging, scripts, and what have you, probably a couple hundred dollars worth of material. And if you want to get in contact with me, I have another site, smartcalling.com, smartcalling.com, no dash. And there you can get tons more content. You can contact me there as well. And um, so we'll just keep it simple. Just remember smart calling and uh, would would love to hear from you and help you along the way. And I, I, I gotta, I gotta do this art because I can't leave you there. You also have an amazing podcast, the art of selling, uh, which I am a huge fan of. I, I actually, you just did an episode recently. It made me laugh. Cause I think you were going through some of your older sales notes from the eighties and nineties. I think the episode was these sales tips are older than some of you in the audience and they still work. And I laugh cause yes, they are. they still work in the overarching theme. Be smart, be empathetic and more, more, more than anything. Let's be real have some common sense. So with that being said, folks, if you enjoyed the episode, please go ahead and give it a share. But with that being said, Art Subject, thank you for joining us here on today's episode of The Brian Nichols Show. Brian, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to The Brian Nichols Show. Find more episodes at briannicholsshow.com.